we're all familiar with the, the earthquake in Port-au-Prince that leveled that city, with the Indian Ocean tsunami, with the hurricane that, uh, that leveled our own uh, city of New Orleans. At this very moment, Cyclone Pamela is descending upon New Zealand with 30-foot waves. But more sadly than this are the human-made catastrophes. Today's wars in the Middle East, the Syrian refugee crisis. My, my own entree into this field began with a book, Deliver Us From Evil. It was written by Tom Dooley, U.S. Navy physician from St. Louis, who was tasked with caring for the refugees that were escaping from North to South Vietnam at the outset of the war. I was convicted reading his accounts of intervening that this was going to be the career path of my life. And so as a student right here at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, I began looking for opportunities to emulate Dooley. I started off as a junior student at a maternity hospital in Port-au-Prince, delivering babies at a facility that had no gloves, caring for women that were bleeding but had no blood for transfusion, delivering newborns but no blankets in which to wrap them. Well, as a senior student, I worked at the Clinic Evangelico Morava on the eastern seaboard of Honduras as a resident physician at the Galmi Hospital in West Africa, uh, after graduating at the Charity Hospital in the city of Shanghai, where we mostly cared for people suffering from tuberculosis, schistosomiasis, rheumatic fever, the typical diseases of poverty. But my longest stint of service was in the southern African nation of Angola. Uh, in the 90s, Angola was enveloped in a civil war. It had no police force, no operating schools, very little in the way of hospitals, and 15 landmines per capita. More landmines per person than any other nation in the world. Well, one evening I was, heard a knock at the door, and it was Pastor Eliseo. He brought his daughter, Antonia, and this girl was coughing and wheezing and febrile. Clearly she was suffering from pneumonia. If she had been in Kansas City, she would be in intensive care at our own Children's Mercy Hospital. Of course, I took her to the clinic, did what we could, gave her an antibiotic, I gave her father oral rehydration fluid to, to feed his daughter overnight. And as I left them on the cot, I thought, tomorrow morning, this cot will probably be empty. Well, the war escalated. I had to evacuate my family. Uh, from Angola with uh, just two days notice and I came back here to the University of Missouri where I began teaching public health and medicine and one of the things I wanted my students to know is some very basic facts about epidemiology when women do live longer than men and there's some very good reasons for that <laughs> you see guys we innovate we want to find a way to accomplish a challenge in front of us now, do you see women doing things like this? No, they know way better than that. But, but we have a way of getting it done. And this is something that can start at a very early age. Guys, you can recognize this. I find this one rather shocking myself. <laughs> and this has been going on for a long time, men. Can you just imagine? Well, Statistics. About 5,000 teams of healthcare personnel leave the United States every year to work in a developing country, usually for a time period of five to seven days. This is a phenomenon that is only growing and spreading everywhere. What is the draw? Why is it that healthcare people are so interested in this kind of service? Well, certainly we care for some people. We experience an exotic culture. We might we might see an exotic disease that we're not familiar with. And on the balance, there are people that are blessed through this kind of service. There are diseases that are treated. There are children who survive because of this kind of service. But there's a lot of questions as well. Without speaking the language of the people we want to serve, we're greatly impaired. Without understanding their own culture, the nuances of their society, it's very difficult to make a lasting impression. For, there are questions of uh, effectiveness. Is it effective to treat a child for malaria, but not to address bed nets to prevent that malaria? Is it effective to treat a child for diarrhea, but not address 
the safe drinking water that would prevent that diarrhea. There are also questions of ethics. Is it ethical to practice your healthcare profession in another country? I am find it remarkable the number of dentists, therapists, pharmacists, nurses, physicians from the United States who will go to another nation for a week or so without a second thought of whether it is actually legal for them to practice their profession in that country. We certainly would not allow those nationals to practice in our country even if they were providing charity care. There's also a tendency to allow our students to do things in other countries without the kind of supervision that we would normally provide them uh, as students in our own country. Then there are questions of cultural relevance. In Honduras, I was caring for Maria and her twin babies. So Maria brought her babies in, and I did a standard well-child exam. I, I weighed them, I measured their head, I listened to their heart, I gave them their vaccinations. And the next day, Maria returned without her babies, and she was livid. She walked into the clinic and said, that doctor, that doctor put a curse on my babies and my babies are dying. They're crying. They're fevering. My babies are dying because of that doctor. And the people, of course, they started finding their way to the exit. You know, what's going on here? And I was on the other side of, of the room and I, I came out with my interpreter. I don't speak her native language. And I, and I said to her, I am so sorry, I didn't mean to harm your babies. She was so angry. Tell me, what, what did I do wrong? And she, says, she looks at me and she says, well, you put that cold thing on my baby's chest. You pressed on my baby's stomach. You stuck that sharp thing in my baby's leg. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's prenatal or standard well-child visit. That, that's what we do. But you never said that my babies were pretty. You never said how fortunate I am to have such lovely babies. So clearly you hate my babies, and that's why my babies are fevering, and that's why my babies are vomiting. And I said to her, oh, well, what do I need to do? I'm so sorry. What? Well, you must remove the curse, says Maria. Remove the curse. They didn't teach me that in medical school. <laughs> so I, I put my hand on the baby's head, and I raised the other hand to heaven, and I, I pronounced a blessing upon her babies, and uh, curse remove. And Maria starts to relax, and she says, oh, now I know that my babies will survive. Short-term medical missions. Ideally, they are effective. Ideally, they're done in an ethical way, and they're also culturally relevant. How can we get it right? Well, it begins with national partnerships, working in hand-in-hand -hand with hosts who show us how to do it right. Now, what sort of partnerships are we looking at? It might be a healthcare institution that invites us. It might be a government. It might be a civic organization, a rotary club, a church. People who will show us what is the most effective within that society. Some of you are familiar with the, the book of Philippians. In chapter 2 it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility consider others above yourselves. And so with that attitude of humility, we start by asking, how can I help? Now, perhaps what they want is manpower. Maybe they need us to actually see patients one by one and give vaccinations person by person. But that might not be actually what they need or want the most. Perhaps what they really need is supplies. Maybe they need gloves for that maternity hospital. Maybe they need blankets in which to wrap those babies. Maybe they need vaccines. It could be that actually what they want more than anything is for us to teach them a skill. How to resuscitate a newborn baby. How to care for a maternal complication at the time of childbirth. How to care for a trauma person. Skill transfer that could actually bless multitudes of people as it is passed on from person to person. There are particular health professions like eye doctors who can remove cataracts and give people their sight back. Plastic surgeons who can repair that cleft lip for a child that will bless them the rest of their lives. Very effective and can be done in a short period of time. And then as we are serving, we also need to ask, what can I learn to better serve your people? Tell me about your holidays. Tell me about what you worry about. Tell me, what are the dreams of your young people? How can I better serve by knowing your own people? Now, is this possible in five to seven days? Of course not. 
Which brings me to the second intervention, and that is ongoing commitment. Begin a relationship, build a relationship, and then keep it going, even if it's for short intervals at a time. And I want to give you three examples of this in action. Uh, the first is Tim Myrick, a physician from Lee Summit, about 20 miles from here. He has a heart for the Horn of Africa, the northeastern corner, guns, chaos, social disruption, but he has identified a community that has a school, that has a hospital, where he's been going every three months for years. He teaches in the morning, and in the afternoon he cares for patients. He's, in, he's integrated continuity within his short-term medical service. Following the earthquake in Port-au-Prince, our own Heart to Heart International, located here in Olathe, Kansas, mobilize their people to go down there and provide emergency care for people with crushed injuries, with infections following the earthquake. But in the, the weeks after that, the injuries were better, the infections were better, but there were a lot of people with chronic health issues, with homelessness, and so Heart to Heart didn't stop there. They started providing primary care clinics. You can volunteer in their primary care clinics now, years later, in providing this kind of assistance to Haitian people. And then there's the story of Maison de Naissance. This is a birthing home in Haiti. It started off with a small healthcare team from Kansas City that went down there for five to seven days, taking care of pregnant women and newborn babies, and quickly realizing that they could do nothing of significance in five to seven days. And so what they did was they partnered with the Archdiocese of Haiti to establish a birthing home which today, 12 years later, is catching babies, is doing it in a modern way, and is entirely staffed by Haitians. How can short-term medical missions get it right? Well, it begins with being effective, being ethical, being culturally relevant, and that comes through national partnerships and ongoing commitment. Well, that evening, I left Pastor Liliseo and Antonia in the cot, wondering if they'd still be there. The next morning I returned, I walked into the clinic building, and the cot was empty. My heart sank. And then I heard a giggle. And around the corner came this little girl, followed by her dad. Well, I continued volunteering in Angola, as I've done every summer for the last 12 years, and uh, last year, this middle-aged man came up to me, along with his teenage daughter, big smile. I'm Pastor Eliseo, remember me? I hear that you have been returning every summer to serve my people in Angola. And I came simply to express my thanks. <laughs>